when I asked you if you're awake, so that's good. I know, I know uh, we're tired and uh, we all are, are there, but I believe God has something he wants to share with us this morning. We've been on a journey with Joseph and it's really been a wild ride, hasn't it? All right, I mean, there's, there, you could never, even the, the, the best Hollywood script writer could not write a script that would describe Joseph's life, right? You know, growing up as a favorite in dad's home with the best clothes and, and all those things and then being sold by his brothers and winding up in Egypt and working for Potiphar and running Potiphar's house and then getting accused of rape and thrown into prison and, and then now after so many years being exalted to be the governor of Egypt, second most powerful man in the world. He's been given a new name, he's been given new clothes, a new ring, a new wife, and he has been tasked with providing for the future of Egypt and the world by overseeing a grain collection for seven years. And so all that has been, been going on and taking place. And, uh, I shared with you Corey Ten Boom's a little tiny bit of her story earlier in the week and a few of her quotes and I wanted to start off with, with something I read that she said and it says, she said this, she says, this is what the past is for. Every experience God gives us, every person he puts in our lives is the perfect preparation for the future that only he can see. You see, all along, through the waiting, through all of the things that have been happening to Joseph, God was at work. The unseen hand of God was at work in Joseph's life. And God was preparing him for something he could have never imagined, never dreamed, and never planned. And now Joseph is in an incredible position. And this morning and tomorrow, we're going to focus on now what's going to become one of the most interesting, most unusual family reunions of all time. How many of you go to family reunions? All right. How many of you would say sometimes it's really awkward? All right. And you just have to almost pretend you're not there, right? You know, sometimes it's awkward, but I can promise you as awkward as your family reunions might be, we're going to encounter a more unusual and awkward family reunion. And this morning, what I want us to primarily do is to view this family reunion through the eyes of Joseph's brothers and his dad. And then tomorrow, we're going to try to look at it through Joseph's eyes. We're going to cover a lot of text and a lot of ground. I, I trust that many of you are familiar with Joseph's story, and so we'll summarize some things to catch us up and then zero in and focus in on some, some things that I think God might want to speak to us this morning. So let's begin in Genesis chapter 42 and, and just sort of highlight verses 1 through 28. And in Genesis chapter 42, we, we've left Egypt and we're back in the land of Canaan. We're back with Jacob and Joseph's family. And the famine that is going on now in Egypt is also going on in Canaan. And Joseph's family Jacob, his dad, his brothers, they are starting to run out of food. And so in Genesis chapter 42, it says that, that Jacob heard that there was grain available in Egypt. And so, of course, he has absolutely what? No idea that it was his son who had organized and orchestrated and collected all of this food. And so he tells his sons, he, he basically says, if you look there in, in verse 1, he's like, why are you standing around looking at each other? All right. Can you just kind of hear one of your parents saying that? All right. Guys, why are you just standing around staring at each other? Go do something. Go get us some food. And, and so he sends them, but he will not let his youngest son Benjamin go. So he sends the ten oldest brothers, but he said he would not let Benjamin go for fear, verse 4, that some harm might come to him. And so we get an inkling already of, of what's going on in Jacob's heart. And Jacob's heart is filled with fear. And Benjamin, if you remember, is the second son of his favorite wife. And so he's lost Joseph, and he cannot bear the thought of losing Benjamin. And so he does not allow him to go. So it says in verse 5 that Jacob's sons arrived in Egypt along with the others to buy food. For the famine in Canaan was in Canaan as well. Verse 6, so Joseph was the governor of all of Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people. And it was to him that his brothers came. Now check this out. Last part of verse 6. When they arrived, are you ready? They what? They bowed before him. Remember the dreams. 
Remember Joseph had shared dreams. He says, I had this dream. And, and, and basically the, the interpretation of his dream was, you guys all bowed down to me. And now what has happened? The dream has been fulfilled. But we're going to see that the dream wasn't really about Joseph's brothers bowing down to him. You see, God gives us dreams and God gives us plans and goals for our life, but ultimately they're never really about ourselves. They're always about God and they're always about his purposes. And we're going to see that unfold. And so they bow before him and it says, verse 7, Joseph recognizes them instantly, but they don't recognize him, right? Because it's been a long time. You know, it, it has been over 20 years now. Jacob was 17, and now he's in his late 30s, maybe almost 40, right? And so th there, there is a big difference. He, he dresses like an Egyptian. He has his hair cut like an Egyptian. He shaves like an Egyptian. He talks the Egyptian language. He's dressed in the regal regalia that Pharaoh's governor would be. And so his brothers don't recognize him, but he recognizes his brothers immediately. And at first, it's going to seem like Joseph decides to mess with them a little bit. But as we uncover the text, we'll realize that Joseph's intention was not to mess with his brothers, but he wanted to find out. He wanted to find out what was going on in their hearts and their lives. And so he recognizes his brothers, but he accuses them of being spies. And so here they are there before Joseph, and he says, you guys are spies, and you've come to check out the land and to see how vulnerable we are. And they're like, no, 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 we're not spies. We, we just came here for food. And, and in verse 11, they say something really quite humorous. They, they tell Joseph, they say, we are honest men, sir. And Joseph has to be thinking, yeah, real honest. Would you tell dad again? So he goes back and forth with them and then he says, I'm going to, you know, I think I'm going to just uh, lock you up in prison for a little bit and find out if your story is true. And so he, he puts them in prison for a couple days and then after he lets them out, after three days, he says, he says you've, you've told me about this father you have and your younger brother. And he's probably concerned at this point that maybe they did the same thing to Benjamin that they had done to him. And so he says, here's the deal. I'm going to keep one of you back I'm going to give you the food you requested. I'm going to send you home. And if you want your brother back, and they, they're going to leave Simeon there. And if you want your brother back, then you need to come back with your younger brother, Benjamin. And so they leave. And then when they leave, Joseph does something unusual. Not only does he give them the grain that they need, but he gives them provisions for their journey. And unbeknownst to them, he puts their money in their bags that they paid for the grain. And so it's sort of an, an interesting an interesting story. But look at what happens in all of this, in Joseph's brothers. So look at, look at verse, verse 20. Joseph says, you must bring back your youngest brother, and this will prove that you're telling the truth, and you will not die. So he gives them promises. He says, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to do anything to you, but you need to bring your brother back to me if you want to spring Simeon from jail. Speaking among themselves, verse 21, clearly we are being punished because of what we did to Joseph long ago. We saw his anguish when he pleaded for his life, but we went and listened. And that's why we're in this trouble. <coughs> Reuben says this, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? Isn't that how sibling things go, right? They're all like, oh, well, you know why this is happening. We, you know, this is because of what we did to Joseph. 20 plus years later, the guilt is still overwhelming. And Reuben's like, I told you not to do this. But you wouldn't listen. And now we have to answer for his blood. Verse 23, of course, they did not know that Joseph understood them. See, Joseph's listening, but they don't think he speaks Hebrew. And so he says, for he had been speaking to them through an interpreter. And now he turned away from them and began to weep. And we're going to see as we uncover this family reunion that there are some deep, deep emotions locked up in Joseph's heart that are going to come out. This has not been easy at all for Joseph. When he regained his composure, he spoke to them again, and then he chose Simeon from among them, and he tied them up right before their eyes. And so then he sends them on their way, and he puts their money back in their sacks. And look down at verse 28. When they find out their money's in their sacks, look at what his brothers say. He says, they say, look, he exclaimed to his brothers, my money has been returned. It's here in my sack. And then their hearts sank and trembling, they said to each other, what has God done to us? 
And it's sort of interesting how they respond, isn't it? Because really it's, it's been a blessing, right? I mean, they've been given the food that they need. They've been given provisions. And now they find out, we got our money back. And instead of stepping back and saying, wow, what God, might, might, might God be up to? What is God doing? You know, he, he's really blessing us. But instead, they are so saddled with guilt that they cannot see what God is doing in their life. You know, we talked about temptation a couple days ago. You got, remember back to Tuesday? Anybody? All right. Do you remember some of the things that we said about temptation? I just want to remind you a few things about temptation. Number one, sin always costs more than advertised. I promise you that the day that, that Joseph's brothers decided to sell Joseph to those Ishmaelite traders, they never imagined that more than 20 years later they would still be saddled with this guilt. And so it's clouding them. Sin always costs more than advertised. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. And Joseph's brothers are living this out. In the moment of temptation, we often what? Overestimate the gratification and underestimate the cost. We overestimate the gratification and underestimate the cost. I'm sure that was true of Joseph's brothers. And so now... Their guilt is plaguing them. Simeon is being held hostage. And they have to go back to their dad. You know, have you ever had to, had to go back to your parents when you'd done something wrong or things hadn't gone well and you really didn't want to have the conversation? Anybody ever been there? All right. Well, this is definitely one of those moments. And so they go back and in chapter 42, verses 29 through 39, they have to go back and tell their dad what happened. And, and, and Jacob is extremely upset. And in fact, in verse 35, when they pour out their sacks and they see their money, it says their brothers and their father were terrified, terrified when they saw the bags of money. And Jacob exclaimed, you are robbing me of my children. Joseph is gone. Simeon is gone. And now you want to take Benjamin too because they had told their dad, they said, dad, dad, we don't know why, but the governor of Egypt, he, he accused us of being spies and he locked us up for a few days. And then, you know, we told him about our story. We told him about you. We told him about Benjamin. We told him about we had one brother that's no longer with us. Right. And, and we told him all these things. And then he kept Simeon and he said, we have to bring Benjamin back or, you know, you know, he will never release Simeon. And Jacob is terrified, he's mad, he's upset, and he's starting to have a pity party. Look at verse 36. At the end of verse 36, he says, Everything is going against me. Have you ever had one of those days? Weeks? Months? Years? Hopefully not years. But we've all been there, haven't we? Where we feel like everything is against us, nothing's going right. That's how Jacob feels and so Reuben, the oldest, tries to smooth over the situation. He was like, Dad, Dad, if we go back and we take Benjamin, I'll guarantee his safety, and if we don't bring him back, you can kill my sons. And Jacob's like, ah, oh, no, no, you're an idiot, all right? I don't trust you anyway. You, you already messed up. And guess what? Killing my grandkids isn't going to make the situation any better, all right? Bad idea. But here's the thing, rather than seeing the hand of God at work in their lives, Jacob and his sons, they were unable, they were unable to see the unseen hand of God. Right? God was at work in their lives, but they couldn't see his hand. They couldn't see what he was doing. Why? Well, for Jacob, it was because he was terrified. And rather than trusting that God was at work, he only was looking at things horizontally. Everything is against me. Everything's going wrong. Nothing's going right. Everything. Simeon is gone. Joseph's been gone for so long. And now you want to take Benjamin too. He's having a party for one. All right? It's called a pity party. Have you ever had one? And as many invitations as you send out, usually you're the only one that shows up. And that's what's going on in Jacob's life. Jacob is looking at life horizontally and not vertically. And if you and I are going to see the unseen hand of God in our lives and our circumstances when we're in similar situations, we have to look vertically, not just horizontally. And Jacob is resisting the good work of God in his life. The brothers, 
right? His sons, they can't see what God is doing because of their guilt. They are so overcome with the guilt of what they've done so long ago that they can't see. Their guilt is obscuring. It's like a cloud hanging over their vision and they can't see what God is doing. Jacob can't see what God is doing because reality has reigned in his heart so long. Negative, horizontal thinking, refusing to accept good news kind of thinking is filled his mind. Fatalism is reigning in his heart. And you know what? It's kind of easy to, to sort of jump on their case, isn't it? Have you ever noticed that when, when we read the Bible, especially some of the stories in the Old Testament and where we see people, or even in the New Testament, where we see people really mess up and we sort of think, how could they be so dumb, right? If, if I was, do you, how many of you, when you read the Bible, you tend to make yourself, put yourself in the hero's role in the story, right? Don't you, anybody? All right, a few of us, right? But you know what? Don't we often do the same thing? Don't we often struggle to trust God? when things don't look like they're going well, when circumstances would say that life is not good. Horizontal thinking. It causes panic. And that's what's going on in Jacob's mind. This could have been Jacob's moment. This could have been Jacob's moment. Right? Jacob could have in this moment said, said sons, listen. <coughs> I don't understand what's going on, but I see God's hand in our family. He's provided us with the food that we've needed. He, he sent you back with provisions for the journey. And I don't know why, but the money has been returned to us. I don't know, guys, but God is up to something and, and we can trust him. God keeps his promises. This could have been Jacob's moment, but no, he cannot see it. And so he says, no way. I'm never letting Benjamin go back. No way. Forget it. He knew all about something that we often call Murphy's Law. You guys familiar with Murphy? How many of you think it should be named after you instead? All right. If anything can go wrong, it will. Jacob knew this, and so he's like, no way. No way is my son ever going back. No way. Have you ever had to eat your words? Have you ever said, I'll never, and then you had to, right? Anybody ever been there? Well, this is going to happen with Jacob because eventually they run out of food and the months pass and they have to do something. And so Joseph, Jacob's sons come to their dad and they say, Dad, we've got to go back to Egypt. We've got to go back and get some food. And he's like, okay, okay. And they're like, but Dad, we have to take Benjamin, right? We have to take Benjamin. Oh, no, 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 no. And isn't it just crazy that Jacob was willing to allow Simeon sort of to just to rot in jail because of his fear? But he was like, no way. So finally Judah, Judah just kind of sits down with his dad and has a hashing out with him. And he says, look, dad, we've got to go back and we have to take Benjamin. And he says, I will guarantee his safety. And I will personally take responsible for this. And so Jacob finally, pensively, cautiously sends them back. He tells them to take gifts and nice things. And there, there's something very interesting that he says in, in, in verse 6, and then we'll jump to verse 11. But he says, why, why are you so cruel to me? Why did you even tell him that you had another brother? Why, why didn't you just lie? You know, couldn't you have lied? He's struggling so greatly to trust God. So he tells him to go back and, and take some gifts and then he says this in verse 14. He says, may God Almighty give you mercy. May God Almighty give you mercy as you go before the man so that he will release Simeon and let Benjamin return. But then look at the next sentence. But if I must lose my children, so be it. What a contradictory statement. He says, may God Almighty be with you, the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing God. May that God be with you, right? But if, but if it doesn't work out, oh well. He's really having a crisis of faith. You know, Jacob had had an encounter with this God earlier in his life. And I want you to just look with me, because this term, El Shaddai, Right? One of the names of God, God Almighty. Jacob had encountered him. Look in verse 35 of Genesis. Flip back with me. 
verse 9, or just look at the screen. It says, Now that Jacob had returned to Padam Aram, God appeared to him again at Bethel. And God blessed him, saying, Your name is Jacob, but you will not be called Jacob any longer. From now on, your name will be Israel. So God renamed him Israel, and then God said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. You will become a great nation, even many nations. Kings will be among your descendants. And I will give to you the land I once gave to Abraham and to Isaac. Yes, I will give it to you and your descendants after you. You see, Jacob had encountered El Shaddai. He had encountered God Almighty personally. In fact, he wrestled with him one night. And now God has revealed to him and God's made promises to him. He says, Jacob, I am God Almighty and I'm giving you promises. And so as we look at now how it's lived out, Jacob is really struggling to trust the promises of God. He's struggling deeply because of his fear, because life has happened to him so many times, because life has taught him not to trust God. The experiences of life have taught him not to trust God. And so I want us to just think this morning, what is it, what is it that God might be wanting to teach us today? What is it that God is wanting to, to, for us to understand from Joseph's journey and, and specifically this morning how his dad and his brothers responded to this family reunion? Now I believe that God wants to remind all of us this morning that his unseen hand is at work in our lives and in our circumstances. And that if we are God's children, right, if we have come to God by faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, and we have believed on Him as our Savior, if we've been adopted into His family, into His kingdom, if we're His children, if that is true, then God calls us as His children to walk with Him in such a way that we recognize and look for and realize that His unseen hand is at work in our lives and in our circumstances, even when reality would say otherwise. God wants us to walk by faith and to trust Him. But here's something that I've learned in life. It's a lot easier to walk by sight than it is to walk by faith. You know, I, I went through a pretty difficult season of life a couple of years ago and a difficult transition in ministry. And, 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 and through all those ups and downs, I was having a conversation with a pastor friend one day. And I can just still distinctly remember it. We were leaving a restaurant. We had lunch. And, and I said to him, I said, you know, I said, we talk about faith and walking by faith. And we preach about that. I was like, but walking by sight is a lot more comfortable. It's a lot safer. And it's a lot easier. And this faith thing is hard. And so faith is hard, but the Bible says without faith, we cannot please God. So how do we walk by faith? How do we not do what, what Jacob did? How do we have a different response? And I could give you, you know, three really great practical tips this morning about how to do that. But you know what? I don't think that's really what we need. I think what we most need, what you need and what I need, if we're going to experience this level of faith, and we're going to learn to see the unseen hand of God in our lives and our circumstances that we need a fresh encounter with El Shaddai. There are moments in life that, that we need to have a fresh encounter with God Almighty. That we need to step back and remember that the God that we serve, the God who has come into our life through Jesus and rescued us and redeemed us and bought us as His own, that God is God Almighty. He is the creator and the sustainer of all the universe. There is no limit to the scope of his power, of his greatness, and of his glory. And you know what? Sometimes the, the realities of life obscure that, don't they? Sometimes the realities of life obscure the reality of God, and we just don't see him for who he is. And our problems get so big, and they're so, so imminent in our life. And, and listen, our pain is real. Our hurts are real. Our problems are real, and sometimes they're big. But I want you to know this morning that God is greater he is bigger, He is more powerful, He is for you and He is with you. And sometimes we just need to have a fresh encounter, a fresh vision of who God is. So many times the realities of life obscure the reality of God. And it can be all kinds of things. For Joseph's brothers, it was their guilt. Their guilt obscured that reality. Maybe you've got some guilt hanging over your life today. Some things that, that you know that just are not right, that are, that are not been dealt with. And here's the thing, you can deal with that. You can come to God Almighty 
who already knows and say, God, I've got some guilt and I want you to set me free. I want you to forgive me and I want you to set me free from that guilt so I can see you again. For, for Jacob, it was the harsh realities of life and the pain and the hurt. And if that's you this morning, you need to see that there's a greater reality and his name is El Shaddai, God Almighty. I love what it says in Psalm 46, verse 7. It says, The Lord, Yahweh Almighty, is with us. The God of, let's say that out loud, the God of Jesus. is our fortress. This was written many, many years later. God didn't give up on Jacob. God did not give up on Jacob because Jacob had a faith crisis. God did not give up on his plans for Jacob's family. God did not give up on his promises. Aren't you thankful for that? And if you are in a situation where you say, you know, my, my faith really has faltered and, and it's not all that it should be, here's the amazing thing that you can know and trust. God has not let go of you. And God's purposes and plans for your life have not been altered. And God's love for you is just as deep and just as strong. The Lord Almighty... God Almighty is with us. He is with you. And the God of Jacob is your fortress. My prayer, my desire for you, and listen, I know many of you are walking through some really hard things. And I wish, I wish that that wasn't the case. And I wish that, that life didn't come with trials and tribulations. Remember I told you, I like comfort. But here's what I want you to know. If you're there and if you're walking through that, whether it's guilt or whether it's a trial or whether it's difficulty, I want you to know that the unseen hand of God is at work in your life. That God is there. He's not abandoned you. He's not given up on you. And not only that, He's not a God who is powerless. He is God Almighty. And He is able to work in your life. He's able to shape the things that are happening for good. God is working all things together for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purposes. It's my prayer, it's my desire that this morning, just in these few moments and, and maybe throughout the rest of your time here at camp, that you would get a fresh vision for who God is. That having come here and away from the normal routines of life, that you would get a vision, a fresh vision. You know, it's one of the great things that God did for me when I was a camper was that He enlarged my vision of who He was. I want to close with with a statement and then one more verse. Faith in God is not a denial of reality. It's not saying that things aren't real, but it's a trust in a greater reality. God is greater than anything that you face and anything that you go through. Psalm, or 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Peter says this, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. That's God's promise for you and to you. And no matter what you're facing and no matter what you're going through in life, Peter, who was writing to a church that was experiencing great persecution, he says this, we have a living hope because Jesus rose from the dead. And we have an inheritance that's reserved for us that can never be taken away. And I want you to have a fresh vision of who God is and that hope. Would you bow your heads this morning? And just in a moment of, uh, of reflection and, and prayer, and, and just in maybe in, in just honesty this morning, if you'd say, you know what, I, I'm really struggling in faith. Th this, I, I mean, I believe God and, and I know God and I love God, but I'm really struggling to trust Him because of the circumstances of my life or guilt or, or something going on. And would you pray for me because I want to have that fresh touch, that fresh encounter. I need that. Would you raise your hand just so I could pray for you this morning? Thank you so much for your courage, for your honesty. God sees your hand, but more importantly, He sees your heart. I want to pray for you this morning. Father in heaven, God Almighty, Father, so many times I have lost sight of who you are. We all have. So many times, Father, the realities of life have obscured you. And so, Father, I just pray this morning that, that we would look up above our circumstances and realize that you are God Almighty. And Father, I pray especially for those who have indicated this morning that they need, they need you this morning. They need that, 
that fresh touch from your hand. They, they need the curtain to part. They need to see you again for who you are. Father, I pray that out of the abundance of your mercy and your grace that you would do that. And Father, I pray for all of us that we might have a fresh encounter with your greatness, with your glory, with your majesty, with your splendor, with your power. Father, that and it might cause us to realize that you are able to work in our lives and our circumstances and that it would cause us to be able to walk by faith and not by sight. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.